This lesson is a survey of the experiments that led up to the discovery of DNA and a review of DNA as a nucleic acid. For this lesson, we need to think from a historical perspective. We need to think back before today when we know so much about DNA and how it regulates all of our traits. For this lesson, think of that we only knew the following. We knew that living things are made up of molecules. We knew they were made up of the big four macromolecules, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. We knew that traits are inherited, that something is passed down from parents to their children, and that children, their offspring, vary in their traits. One sibling can be taller or shorter than another. We also knew that cells were able to make copies of this molecule, whatever it may be. But there was still so much more to learn. We didn't know what determined heritable characteristics, why it is that you have the height or the eye color that you have. What in the cell is carrying this information? What molecule is responsible for the blueprint of the traits that offspring have? And how is this information copied? There were five pivotal experiments that led us to be able to answer these questions, and I'm going to go over each one. The first one was Griffith's experiment. Griffith had rats and noticed that his rats would get infected with pneumonia and die. He wanted to know, was it the disease, the pneumonia, that made them ultimately perish, or is pneumonia producing some kind of poison or toxin, and that is what's causing them to get sick and die? So to answer this question, he took a sample from his sick mice, and he observed that there were two different bacterial colonies that grew from this sample. Some of them appeared smooth, so we called them smooth colonies, and others appeared rough. So thinking back to Griffith's question, he wants to know, is it a disease that's causing them to die or the poison? If you were Griffith, what kind of an experiment would you create to determine if it's the disease or the poison? Take a moment to think what you could do. Well, here's what Griffith did. Griffith separated out the smooth colonies and the rough colonies. And then in a third group, he heat killed the smooth colonies. Now, why do that? Well, if you kill the bacteria, if they produced any poison, the poison would still be in the sample, but the bacteria would be dead. So that could conclusively prove if it was or was not poison from the bacteria that made his mice sick. So he took these three different samples, got three different rats, injected it into them, and here are the results. What can we conclude? Well, it looks like the mouse that got the smooth colonies died, whereas the ones that got the rough colonies and the heat killed colonies survived. So that means that it is the disease making them sick. It is the pneumonia that is causing those mice to die, but only the smooth ones, not the rough ones. Now, not much is being told to us here about DNA from this experiment. Thankfully, Griffith didn't stop there. Griffith then went on and wanted to know, well, what is it about these smooth disease-causing bacteria that are making the mice sick? So he took his two separate colonies, the disease-causing smooth colonies and the harmless rough colonies, and he decided to keep the smooth ones around but killed them. He applied heat to the smooth colonies to kill them, and he kept the rough colonies alive. And then he combined the two into one syringe. So I have disease-causing ones that are dead, so they shouldn't have any effect at all on the mice. And then I have living, harmless bacteria. What do you think is going to happen when that's injected to the mouse? Well, it died. That's weird. It shouldn't have died. The disease-causing smooth colonies, they're heat-killed. They're not there. The harmless ones, they're alive, but they're harmless. So Griffith wanted to know what happened, cut open his mouse, and here's what he found. Even weirder. The disease-causing ones that were killed somehow are back to life, and the harmless ones have disappeared. Bizarre. What can I conclude from this? Well, Griffith proposed the idea of transformation. It could be that the dead disease-causing smooth colonies passed their ability to cause disease to the harmless bacteria. It wouldn't make any sense for the harmless bacteria to disappear or for the disease-causing ones to come back to life. What may make more sense is some kind of molecule from the disease-causing colonies entered the harmless rough colonies and transformed them. So what did we learn from this? This showed that there's some non-living molecule that causes traits. There's some non-living thing from the dead smooth colonies that was transferred to the living ones that caused their traits to change. Next up is Avery's experiment. 
Avery wanted to know how is this gene, this non-living molecule, able to change the bacteria that kill the mouse. He realized that there are four molecules that make up all of life, carbs, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids, and determined that one of them has to be this molecule. So he wondered, what kind of an experiment could I do to isolate if it's a carb, a lipid, a protein, or a nucleic acid that is causing this transformation observed by Griffith? So to do this, Avery turned to enzymes, a reminder that enzymes are proteins that can break one specific substrate. So this is a great way to identify and isolate which of these molecules is responsible for the transformation. I can use an enzyme that destroys carbs and see what happens, an enzyme that destroys lipids and see what happens, and so on. So this is what Avery did. So Avery took the heat-killed disease-causing bacteria and added some enzymes that destroy carbs, injected it into the mouse, and it died. That means carbs are not what's causing the gene. If he destroys the gene, the mouse will live because the bacteria will not be transformed. They will not be harmful. So he did it again with anti-lipid enzymes and the mouse died. Did it again with anti-protein enzymes? Dead mouse again. Then he did it again with anti-RNA enzymes and the mouse died. So that means it can't be a carb, can't be a lipid, can't be a protein, can't be RNA. Then he did the experiment with anti-DNA enzymes. And in that instance, the mouse lived. So what does this mean? That means that the gene, whatever's causing that transformation that made the bacteria lethal, has to be made out of DNA. Because only when you destroy DNA does the bacteria not get transformed. Now this was a very controversial finding at the time. Most people believe that protein, not DNA, is the molecule of heredity. And intuitively that makes sense. Proteins are very, very sophisticated. They're three-dimensional. If there's any molecule complex enough to have a blueprint for something as sophisticated as a human like yourself, it's probably going to be a protein. So here comes Hershey and Chase. Hershey and Chase were very skeptical of Avery, and they wanted to have a more sophisticated experiment to conclusively prove if it's protein or DNA that's causing heredity. So they decided to use bacteriophages in their experiment. A bacteriophage is a virus that only has two parts. It is DNA in the middle, and it is a protein coat on the outside. Perfect for an analysis such as this. Another thing these bacteriophages do is we knew that when they approached a bacteria, they would appear. It appeared like they would inject something into the bacteria. And afterwards, multiple viruses, their progeny, their offspring would come out, and the bacteria would ultimately be destroyed. So... If I want to know if it's a protein or DNA that's causing heredity, I just need to figure out what is that virus injecting into the bacteria. Is it injecting DNA or is it injecting protein? So to test this out, they decided to use radioactive isotopes. Turns out sulfur-35 is a radioactive isotope that attaches only to protein, and phosphorus-32 is an isotope that attaches only to DNA. By having two batches of bacteriophages, one with sulfur to the protein and one with phosphorus to the DNA, they were able to track what enters or what does not enter the bacteria. So they set up two groups. They had each group infect a different portion of bacteria and then measured where they found radioactivity. After running this trial, they found none of the sulfur inside the bacteria, so the protein was not injected in, but they did find phosphorus-32. Phosphorus was injected into the bacteria. What did this do? It conclusively proved that it has to be DNA. DNA has to be what Avery observed. It has to be what Griffith observed. That's the only way we could explain why phosphorus was inside the, bacteri inside the bacteria and not sulfur. Notice how cumulative all these experiments are. So there isn't one scientist that has some crazy breakthrough on their own. Scientists are constantly collaborating, confirming, and disproving each other's work, and it is building on this spectrum that leads us to actual sincere discovery. So now that we know it's DNA, there were many more questions we wanted to answer. What does DNA look like? What's its structure? Because if we can determine that, that'll tell us its function, and that's the function of heredity itself, why living things have the characteristics they do. So along came Rosalind Franklin. Rosalind Franklin developed a new process of taking pictures of molecules called X-ray diffraction. And what you're seeing here is the world's first ever picture of DNA. Imagine you're looking down the top of a straw. That's what you're seeing here. So here's the portion of the straw that's close to your eye. 
Here's the portion that's further away. And these bands here are the DNA molecule. This was huge. Now we had an idea that DNA appears to twist into a helix. We're getting closer to its structure. Here's the unfortunate dilemma with Rosalind Franklin. Rosalind Franklin worked with a male counterpart in her lab, and typically you keep your results close to your vest until you publish them. That way you're receiving the credit for the work that you do. Well, her male counterpart was fraternizing or spending time with two scientists in the United States. Those two scientists were Crick and Watson. Crick and Watson were also trying to figure out the problem of, well, what is the structure of DNA? But they took a different approach. Instead of trying to take a picture of it, they built 3D models and tried to propose that since those model pieces fit together, that must be the structure of DNA. Well, at a party, Crick and Watson ran into Rosalind Franklin's male colleague. That male colleague brought a picture of her work and in 1953 showed it to Crick and Watson before it was published. Crick and Watson had been failing again and again with their models until they saw this picture. As soon as they saw this picture, they immediately biked back to their lab and built a model of DNA as a double helix, and the pieces fit together. Only when they made their model a double helix could they explain all of the constituent parts of DNA and how they fit together. Crick and Watson then published their work. When they published their work, they didn't mention that they saw Russ and Franklin's x-ray. Crick and Watson went on to win Nobel Prizes, and even today they're credited largely with the discovery of DNA as a double helix, but it wasn't until much, much later, 20, 30 plus years, that they admitted that they saw Ross and Franklin's work. I think with Ross and Franklin is she passed away shortly after her work was publicized, and she didn't really get, receive any credit for DNA being a double helix. Thankfully, posthumously after her death, she was awarded a Nobel, and ultimately now history tells the real story. So I just want to point that out, that unfortunately humans are humans and horrific things can happen even in science. But it's important that once we know that, we recognize it and everyone knows what really happened so that individuals like Rosalind Franklin receive the credit they deserve. So these were the big five experiments that led to the discovery of DNA being the molecule of heredity. Griffith, Avery, and Hershey conclusively proved that it has to be DNA that's a molecule that's causing traits. And then Rosalind Franklin and Crick and Watson contributed to our understanding of DNA being a double helix. Now experiments don't end there. There's a couple more I'd like you to know. T.H. Morgan worked with fruit flies. So what's great about working with fruit flies is they don't live that long, they reproduce quickly, and they have a lot of weird traits that will appear at an odd frequency. Working with them, he was able to associate that white-eyed males, because only males would have white eyes, was related to a chromosome, a structure of DNA inside the cell. Why was this important? This showed us that genes are located on chromosomes. Knowing that, we now know exactly what structures to pay attention to when trying to understand the blueprint of life. Another important scientist is Chargaff. Chargaff was a chemist who was also interested in the question of understanding DNA. As a chemist, Chargaff was primarily concerned with just what were the quantity of molecules inside of DNA. So what he did is he took samples from a huge variety of species, animals, insects, plants, and just counted how many adenines, thymines, guanines, and cytosines there were in the organism. And there quickly developed a pattern, and you'll see it too. Here's a sample of Targaff's work on humans. So he discovered that about 30.9% is made up of adenine, 29.4% is made up of thymine, 19.9% guanine, and 19.8% cytosine. This is where we got our base pairing rules that A always binds with T and G always binds with C. They're commonly referred to as Chargaff's rules. Now, we can't shrink ourselves down and look at a DNA molecule and conclusively prove this is happening, but when you look at the quantities, this is the only possible way the bonding can occur. There's always a somewhat equal portion of G's to C's and A's to T's. That's why adenine always goes to thymine and guanine always goes to cytosine. But we still have this question of how is DNA copied? How is DNA able to replicate itself across cells? We want to understand how it is that living things can replicate their DNA throughout their lifetimes and do so faithfully, that there aren't dramatic changes from cell to cell or from generation to generation. There were three viable models for how DNA would replicate, and at the time they were theoretical until proven. One model is the idea of conservative replication. If my blue DNA molecule here is my original DNA molecule, this is showing you what is made as new 
when DNA is replicated. So with a conservative model, my original DNA strand remains intact, and I generate an entirely new strand that is identical. And then I do that again when I do a second generation. So with a conservative model, I end up with one original strand that's unaltered and three new strands. Another model was the semi-conservative model. The idea behind this is the original strand is conserved half of the time. Meaning, when this DNA strand is replicated, I have one strand that has an original strand, and I have one new strand. So I have one dark blue and one light blue in each of my new daughter strands. And then when I replicate again, I end up with two completely new strands, one strand that's 50-50 and another strand that's 50-50. And another model was dispersive. The idea with the dispersive model is that the DNA molecule would disperse. It would break off into chunks, and then the cell would build new strands wherever the chunks were missing. So you would end up with the original strand dispersed amongst all of the daughter strands. Now to understand which of these models is correct, we needed to do experiment to prove that our theory was accurate. That is when Melson and Stahl came along. Messel and Stahl, often credited with creating the most beautiful experiment in biology, decided to use radioactive isotopes, specifically heavy nitrogen, to track the difference between the parental DNA strand and the daughter DNA strands. To explain that another way, Melson and Stahl took an original DNA double helix and had it be created with nitrogen 15. So wherever that original parent strand went, they would be able to find nitrogen 15. They then provided that DNA strand a lighter isotope, nitrogen-14. So wherever they measured nitrogen-14, that would be a new DNA strand that was built. So here was their prediction. This was their positive control of sorts, a control that shows what will happen if you get a positive result. With one round of replication, if the conservative model is true, then they should have a band that has only nitrogen-15. Why? Because that original molecule is conserved. They'll also have a band that is made only of nitrogen-14. Why? This is the band that wasn't conserved, the one that was replicated, the one that is new. Now, if they did one round of replication with semi-conservative, they should have a band that's 50-50, a band that's 15 nitrogen from the parent and 14 nitrogen from the new one that's created. Dispersive would be the same. We still have those original chunks, but they're split up. Well, this showed them they can only do one round of replication. Why? Well, if I end up with a band of 15 and 14, I don't know if it's semi-conservative or dispersive. That is the method DNA replicates by. So they did a second round of replication. For conservative, if that model's correct, I should still have a band of only 15 and a band of only 14 because the original 15 is conserved. If it's a semi-conservative model, then I should have a band that's half and half, and a band that's only nitrogen-14 because it's created only of new material. And if it's dispersive, I should still just have a band that's 50-50 because in the dispersive model, it carried all the way through. So these are our positive controls. Let's look at the results that they got in their experiment. Here was their parental strand, so only nitrogen-15. Here was their first replication, a band of 14-15. So that means it could be either semi-conservative or dispersive. But then with their second replication, they got one band of 1415 and one band of 1414. That conclusively proved that semi-conservative replication is the method by which DNA replicates. Very elegant way to experimentally prove which of these three models is accurate. So let's just review nucleic acids a little bit. A reminder, nucleic acids, as we just saw from all these experiments, are the genetic material is the genetic material that stores information for the cell. This is where I find genes or sections of DNA that code for protein. This is the information that's transferred from generation to generation. A nucleic acid is made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. It's used to pass down information, and its monomer is a nucleotide. A reminder that a nucleotide has three parts. It has a phosphate group, a sugar, and an nitrogenous base. The nitrogenous bases vary in DNA, and an RNA. In the case of DNA, the four nitrogenous bases are adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. So here I have a DNA nucleotide of a phosphate, a sugar, and a base. When they combine, we're going to build a bond between the phosphate and the sugar and stack them on top of each other. That way information can be read in either orientation. There are two types of nucleotides. 
Some of them have two rings in the nitrogenous base. We refer to those as purines. It's a double nitrogen ring. Adenine and guanine are the purines for nucleic acids. And then other class is pyrimidines. Pyrimidines are made up of only one carbon ring, and they are cytosine, thymine, and uracil. A reminder that uracil is only found in RNA, and thymine is only found in DNA. When building nucleotides together, that bond that forms between the phosphate and the sugar is formed by what's called a phosphodiester bond. So that is phosphate bonding with four oxygens. So let's build a DNA strand. I'm going to form phosphodiester bonds, making a sugar phosphate backbone. And then I'm going to attach my complementary base pairs according to Chargaff's rules. G goes to C and A goes to T. When they bond together, they're forming hydrogen bonds. And hopefully you notice that there are numbers on the end of each one. Down here it says 3 prime end, and up here it says 5 prime end. What does that mean? Well, if I count the carbons on the sugar, I start here 1, 2, 3. This is indicating that the third carbon is pointing down. Here I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This indicates the fifth carbon is pointing up. It's important to know the 5 prime and 3 prime ends of the DNA molecule because DNA is anti-parallel. What I mean is, one strand here is pointing with five up and three down. The other strand is completely flipped, but running parallel. The second strand here has five pointing down and three pointing up. DNA is a molecule with a double helix. We find it in eukaryotes and prokaryotes. And deoxyribose is the sugar found within it. That's why we call it deoxyribonucleic acid. I bring this up because it's important to draw comparisons with the other nucleic acid, RNA, or ribonucleic acid. RNA is used in protein synthesis, a process we'll learn about in the future, and we call it RNA because it is made of the sugar ribose instead of the sugar deoxyribose. I hope this lesson was helpful in you understanding the scientific process and thinking and the cumulative work that led to the discovery of DNA and as a nice refresher of the structure of DNA. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.